Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first of three lectures that are going to take us through Chapter 5 for IR Honors, talking about understanding conflict, really talking more in depth about the nature and causes of conflict in war. Uh, this whole unit is going to go a lot more into depth about where conflict is coming from and how do we attempt to prevent that conflict. So our first section here is talking about the nature of armed conflict. What does it look like? How do we tell what is and what isn't? And how do we proceed from there? So our major objective that we're trying to do today is to identify both the nature and the forms of armed conflict. And we're going to be not only discussing that, but discussing how unconventional warfare has kind of become the norm in our modern times. So I want to start before we get too far by reminding you about this quote. We first saw it in Chapter 3 when we talked about realism. And it was Hans Morgenthau's idea that all states are either preparing in, sorry, preparing for, recovering from, or engaged in war. If you take a look at the United States today, you can't say that we're necessarily preparing for war, although we're always building our militaries to be stronger. You can say that we're recovering from wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you can say that we're even partially engaged right now and taking a look at the possibility of being engaged in war there. Uh, so whether or not this applies to the United States today, another story altogether. For us, though, it really needs to be something we keep in perspective. When we talk about war, we're talking about a huge toll of life, whether it's American soldiers, and if you've ever had a chance to visit Arlington National Cemetery, or even the, uh, the National Cemetery in Jacksonville. It's a really moving experience to see the men and women who have given their lives for the service of our country. If we consider the human toll of war so high, why does it continue? The reason has a lot more to do with fighting for what people believe in. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today. Okay. In terms of armed conflict, war itself is relatively rare. We don't see a lot of it, even now. Uh, we haven't seen a full-on, full-blown interstate conflict in several years. Armed conflict itself is a regular feature in IR, and it continues to occur around the world. But actual war, when we're talking about two states going to war, is relatively rare. It's not something we see in every country in the world, and there are several countries who have never been directly touched by it. And that should be of note. As of 2010, according to the UCDP uh, Conflict Encyclopedia, and I really do encourage you, if you take a look down here, this link at the very bottom below the key is one worth taking a look at, just to get an idea of where the active armed conflicts in the world are. And when we talk about current active armed conflicts, we're really looking, again, take a look, in the Middle East, in portions of sub-Saharan Africa. And we do have some ongoing conflicts internally in Russia, uh, internally within areas of uh, South America, Latin America. And the United States, remember, is still involved in what we call an internationally internationalized conflict. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. In terms of regions of the world, though, just from 1946, the end of World War II to the present, really the modern era, we're seeing that Asia, and specifically Asia, has been more of a region touched by armed conflict. Africa has improved over the years as well as increased the levels of armed conflict. Additionally, the Middle East, also very important. But this is just in sheer number of conflicts. Number of conflicts means nothing compared to the size of what those conflicts could possibly be. There are three major types of war, and these types are based on which countries or which groups are involved. So the first type is the classic idea of war. When we think of war, we're thinking of two countries clashing over any number of issues. Uh, that's an interstate war. Okay, uh, The U.S.-Iraq War of 2003 is a great example of an interstate war. And most of the things that you probably studied in history in terms of what war looks like is an interstate war. We don't rarely talk about other kinds of conflict, especially in history courses. 
In terms of intrastate or civil war, there's war between two or more groups within a territory. Uh, if you take a look at the current conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo with a number of their rebel groups, even though it's calming down, the uh, M23 rebels in the DRC. You can take a look at Uganda and the Lord's Resistance Army. You can take a look at Mali versus the Al-Qaeda of the Islamic Maghreb. Uh, you can take a look back in American history, the idea of the secession of the South. Uh, these were all intrastate or civil wars. Okay, Two or more groups within a territory fighting for supremacy. The third type of war is a, what we call an extra-systemic or an extra-state war. It's a combination of war between states and non-state groups, or, as we like to call them, non-state actors, as we've discussed. The idea of the United States fighting al-Qaeda around the world, the war on terror, as we called it, this was an extra-systemic war. It was beyond the pale of the international system as we know it, and the U.S. was hunting down members of al-Qaeda, both in Afghanistan, later on in Pakistan, although the Pakistan government wasn't terribly a big fan of that particular action, but around the world, and continuing to hunt down members of al-Qaeda, even to this day, and still capturing them and bringing them in. Now, we can also take a look at war in terms of how it's conducted. We can really classify it in two different types of wars, conventional war and unconventional war. A conventional war is pretty straightforward. It's armed conflict between two or more states in which two things happen. First of all, military forces are going to be used against one another, and weapons of mass destruction, NBC, nuclear biological chemical weapons, are generally not used. Okay? Conventional war leaves the WMDs on the shelf. Now, there's two types of general warfare, or sorry, I should say conventional warfare. There's general war and limited war. This is more of a classification based on the target. In general warfare, everything's fair game. Civilian, military, it doesn't matter. Whereas in a limited war, which is what most of the wars we've seen in modern history have been, it's focused solely on military targets. The trend, unfortunately, over time, has been moving away from limited warfare, moving closer to general warfare. And this is a troubling trend, especially as we move into the 21st century. Unconventional warfare is when traditional battles, the idea of, idea of two armies facing each other on the field, is really kind of shuffled aside. And it's not really organized militaries so much as guerrilla attacks. Uh, the idea of selecting a target, attacking it, attempting to take it, instead of two armies attempting to battle one another. The other catch with unconventional warfare is that targets civilian populations. Because there's a target on civilian populations, this leads it to it being much more general and much more dangerous. There are also two other kinds of war we want to talk about. The idea of a civil war, which we've already mentioned. It's an intrastate conflict. But it's an armed conflict between competing factions within a country or between an existing government and a competing group that would like to control that territory. Okay? The key with a civil war is you have two groups who are fighting for control of the overall country and the overall government. Please bear that in mind when we're talking about civil war versus an intrastate conflict. Not all intrastate conflicts are civil wars, but all civil wars are intrastate conflicts. The last type here is an asymmetric war. Asymmetric war is where you have two groups of very different military size. The U.S. versus the Taliban and Al-Qaeda has very much been an asymmetric war. The United States, with a very large arsenal, a large set of troops, has been facing a group that does not have nearly as much or nearly the ability to try and inflict as much damage. So, in asymmetric warfare, the tactics are a lot different. Instead of focusing on direct attacks on sites that you would use to try and weaken your opponent, you're going to be using guerrilla warfare, very carefully selected targets and sabotage and subversion of those targets. This is also where, when we've been paying attention to the war in Afghanistan, we talk about the idea of these IEDs, these improvised uh, explosive devices on the sides of roads. The idea is to attempt to disrupt convoys, to disrupt 
the larger enemy's ability to carry out any kind of conflict. There's going to be a great link that I'm going to share with you all a little later that talks about how would we fight an asymmetric war. And it's really a good study in how conflict gets taken on, especially when you're facing an enemy that's much larger than you. The truth is, is that warfare, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, has taken on a much different face. When we start to talk about human rights later in the course, one of the major topics we're going to discuss is the idea of child warfare. Because of unconventional warfare, we have moved into a scenario where in many countries, especially in Africa, we're seeing the kidnapping, brainwashing, and forcing of children as young as seven and eight years old to pick up weapons and fight in a civil war that they would otherwise not have any peace or part of. What this creates is a very different atmosphere in many wars. When you see a child coming at you, it's a very different scenario than when you see a full-grown adult soldier. And this is going to create some differences in the way we look at war. In terms of international conflict, though, a good portion of what's happening today is terrorism. Terrorism itself is both unconventional and asymmetric. And we've had a very hard time trying to define terrorism, mainly because what one group's terrorism is, is another group's fight for what they believe in. And that becomes very difficult. There are two types of terrorism we're going to describe here. The idea of state-sponsored terrorism and non-state terrorism. State-sponsored terrorism is where you have a government that's actually sponsoring a terrorist group to carry out attacks wherever they see appropriate. Sometimes this is done so that a government can have something called plausible deniability, giving them an opportunity to not claim that their government was behind something, when in truth they were. Then there is non-state terrorism, which is the one we're most familiar with. And if you think back to September 11th, the attacks by al-Qaeda on the Pentagon, the World Trade Center, and uh, upon the, uh, the fourth flight, which crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. This form of non-state terrorism was extremely difficult to defend against. And we asked the question below, you know, how can a country defend against the use of such weapons? Well, we found it useful to try and increase the security in our lives. Is that enough? And that's going to be a question we'll consider a little later on as we talk about terrorism. There is a great and very easy way for us to try and define terrorism, both by the means and the targets. Okay? When we talk about any kind of war that uses very discriminate means, meaning very specific targeting, and only focuses on combatants, military efforts, that would be limited war, which is what we see in this bottom left-hand quadrant. When we're still using those same discriminant means, but instead we're aiming to non-combatants, that's murder, plain and simple. Uh, when you are planning and plotting something and you're aiming for someone who's not otherwise involved in a conflict, that's murder. It's a war crime and it's something that can be prosecuted by the International Criminal Court. When you're using very indiscriminate means, things that we've discussed like napalm or some indiscriminate weapons, cluster bombs, landmines, and you're aiming at just at combatants, that's a more general warfare. Yes, non-combatants could be brought into the middle of it, but that's not the general aim. But when a group uses indiscriminate means to attack direct non-combatants, we consider that terrorism. This is one definition, and it's not necessarily a correct one, and it's going to be one we debate for a while. And later on, one of your assignments will be to attempt to define terrorism. It's difficult, but we'll try and use the best we can. The idea, though, is that most terrorists are typically attempting to attack to cause or inspire fear for their own political gain. Now, a gentleman by the name of Sederberg is going to have four classifications of terrorists, four different types of terrorists, if you will. The first is criminal terrorism. Criminal terrorism is terrorism strictly for financial gain. We see this when we talk about narco-terrorism, the use of drug cartels trying to terrorize people in order to continue to build their own financial empires. Organized crime is another great example of criminal terrorism. The focus is attempting to gain financially. 
Then there's nihilist terrorism. This is using terrorism to destroy the order of the status quo, to try and create chaos, for chaos's sake. Groups like Weather Underground, which was active in the United States in the 1960s and 70s, is a great example of nihilist terrorism. We don't see a lot of it anymore because of what we'll see later on with nationalist and revolutionary terrorism. Nationalist terrorism is using terrorism in pursuit of ethno-national interests. Groups like the IRA versus Sinn Féin, or, uh, Sinn Féin, which was the groups in Northern Ireland, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the Basque separatists who are seeking independence from Spain, Hamas, who's helping the uh, Palestinians to attempt to uh, gain its own territory. These are nationalist terrorists. And when they specifically will target uh, buses or other locations in Israel, uh, for example, with the PLO and Hamas, they're attempting to influence their po own political targets by trying to push their own, own agendas. The last group is revolutionary terrorists. They use terrorism in pursuit of a broader regional or global transformation of the social order. Groups like Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah are revolutionary terrorists. They're looking to flip the whole system and to set it up more in favor of the political system that they favor. Now, in terms of terrorist attacks since 1982, we've actually started to see a large reduction in overall terrorist attacks. But what has not dropped is the number of significant attacks. We define a significant attack based on the number of people who are targeted and or killed as a result. So overall, attacks are down. People feel slightly more safe. But when attacks do occur, they're much more deadly. This is everything for Chapter 2, Section 1. Uh, sorry, Chapter 5, Section 1. We'll have more on Section 2 coming up later this week. Have a great evening.